I want to, to start with a quote by um, a German writer and literary critic, um, uh, Kurt Tucholsky. He was actually from Berlin. And in the year 1931, he wrote, the people understand most things wrong, but they feel most things correctly. And I think many of us today ask, how is it possible that 61 million Americans have voted for a president, Donald Trump, who polarizes society, who has been openly against immigration and against immigrants and been very negative towards women? How come 11 million French people actually have voted for a party and a candidate who is very xenophobic against foreigners? How come the majority of British citizens had actually decided that they want to leave the European Union? And you can go on and on and on. In most Western countries, we ask ourselves, including in Germany, how come so many people are politically dissatisfied and vote for extreme parties or don't vote at all? What is really behind it? What do they really perceive? What are the facts that they may get wrong or maybe other people get wrong? Or in particular, what do they feel? Before I get to that question, my concern is that we live in a very unusual time where, which I would describe as a time of the three Ps, of populism, of protectionism, and of paralysis. So lack of change, lack of reform, lack of adjustment, in particular on behalf of politicians and political parties. And populism is not really something for or against specific issues. It's about polarizing, it's being against something. And it's about being exposing other people and trying to, to say we are different. It's against immigration, it's often against women, it's often against minorities, it's often against weaker people, poorer people, people who are different from us. And we see that in every walk of life, we see that it comes with a very strong nationalism, that we see in countries people blaming foreigners, blaming the euro, blaming Europe, blaming the US or Asia or China for their own, own mistakes that they commit domestically. It's against other people. And we see the second element, protectionism. This populism, of course, is closely linked to that. That means we have to look out for ourselves and we have to close our borders. We have to kind of separate ourselves from others. And it's in every area of our life and also of our economic life, in terms of trade, in terms of financial markets and capital, and also people moving across borders. And it's about paralysis, that what we see in our time is that even though there is a lot of wealth and a lot of welfare, there's really a lack of reform. There's really paralysis in many political systems of the West that they're not able to cope with this populism and the protectionism to really ask, what can we do? The big miracle, uh, and I'm coming back to the quote of Tucholsky, is we have an incredible amount of welfare and wealth in our societies. Never before in history have so many people have such a high life expectancy, such a high standard of living. And at the same time, if you ask people, so how do you feel about society? More than half, and in some cases, like Germany, like the US, 70% of the people tell you, we feel that social inequality in our countries is too high. So how come that on the one hand, they're doing incredibly well, have jobs, have, have income, have something that our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents never had, and at the same time say, we feel social inequalities too high. We don't feel satisfied with how our society functions. And oftentimes the elites say, well, you know, they just understand things wrong. They just get the facts wrong. We just, you know, they're manipulated by people, by politicians, even by academics. But are they really wrong? And if you look at the facts, we see a very different picture. 40% of workers in countries like the United States or Germany today have lower real wages than they had 20 years ago. So they have lower purchasing power with what they can do. 40% of Americans, 40% of Germans, and in many other countries of the West as well, have no savings, have nothing when their children need something, need, want to participate in a school trip, uh, when they need a new fridge, they have no money to spend on it. When they come to old age and they retire, they have nothing to rely on except, in some cases, some social transfers. So 40% basically are highly dependent on others, on the state to provide for them. We see that poverty rates in many Western countries have increased, and we see that a lot of people 
feel very insecure. And this ideal that many of us have and our parents and grandparents was always everywhere in the West. We want that our children are better off than we are today. We want to make a better life for our children and grandchildren. And many people today realize that no longer works because more and more people are in atypical in employment or no employment at all. Even if they find jobs, they work to very low wages, which are far too low to make a living, so they need additional money from the government or cannot provide for old age. Uh, they have precarious job arrangements, so they can lose their job any moment, any time, very quickly if the uh, employer decides so. So we see also there that people are worried about their future, about their jobs, what will become of my job, my opportunity to create my own life, take responsibility in my own hand. So if you look at the facts, the people are actually not that wrong because social inequality has increased tremendously. Now you can say, so what? And uh, from many perspectives, some people say, look, that's how a market economy works. It creates winners and losers. Um, is that fair? Well, you know, every one of us has a different understanding of what is fair or just or unjust. I, as an economist, I'm interested in the cost, in the economic cost, in the objective cost, how that influences many dimensions, economic, political, and social. And we see many academic studies showing now that higher inequality within a society creates less economic growth, less welfare, less a pool of something that can then be distributed. So it makes a lot of people, all people, worse off. We see it in many other areas. People with low income have a substantially worse health than people with a high income. Three times higher is the probability of men dying before the age of 65 if they have a low income compared to when they have a high income. We see it in terms of poverty rates, and poverty in the Western world is not, in most countries at least, that they don't have housing or food or health care. It's about social participation. They have such low income that they cannot participate in activities, going here to an event like this, going to the movie theater, sending the, ch the children on school trips, or doing things that people do among themselves to be part of society. Um, so this poverty rate has increased substantially, and the social participation has decreased. And it has, it has a very high political cost. Then people who have low income rarely go to vote. And if they go to vote, they vote for extreme parties because they're dissatisfied and they, they really want something different. So it's also a threat to a functional democracy. So in all areas, we see inequality that we have today has massive cost, economic cost, social cost, and a political cost. So the big question is, so what, what, um, what do we do about it? What, what actually can we do? And for that, we first of all need to understand what's really behind it. What's causing that inequality? And many people argue, well, you know, it's, it's a functioning market economy, and as I said before, that's kind of the ideal view, in particular, of economists who say, we have a great market economy, it creates a lot of welfare, and yes, you have losers and you have winners, and that's just how it is. But my key argument is, when you look at the facts, the key driver behind that is not globalization. It's not that markets are functioning so great. The single most important factor behind it is the lack of equality of opportunity. Very few or many people today in Western societies don't have the ability to develop their own skills and talents to bring them into society in the labor market. Oftentimes in early age, early childhood education is so poor for many that at the age of five and six they lack the necessary skills to really enter school and take and benefit from that. So often, uh, often onwards, from very early on, children don't have the same opportunities to access education, develop their talents uh, and abilities. And we see that also in terms of the outcome. We see that people who are born in fa families with low income and low education don't have a chance to really get, or have much worse chances to get a good education, a good ability to enter the labor market, get a good job, get good income, and really make something out of their life. So more than half of every uh, young person's income today is determined by two factors, by the education level and the income of their parents. So it's highly dependent on what family you're born in, what determines your, chain, your, your chance, your destiny, at least in economic terms, in life. So we have low, very low mobility across generations. 
but we also have very low mobility within generations. So people who are poor, uh, who have a low income, have low skills, and have therefore, when they're young, um, a relatively poor job, they have much harder today to really move up, have a better job, have a better income than they had 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. So even there, the mobility does not depend entirely on your skills, on your effort, on your will, what you want to make out of your life, but very much in what situation you are. So you have cross generations, you have within generations, but you also have a huge inequality and rising inequality in, in some instances across groups within society. And one very obvious case is the difference between men and women. In Western societies, the gender pay gap is on average 21%, which means for every one euro a man earns per hour, a woman earns 79 cents. And it's not because women have lower education, because they don't. Women have a higher probability of getting a high school degree. They have a higher probability of going to university. They usually do this in a shorter time period with a better grade, with a lower dropout rate. But it comes when it comes to the labor market, they face huge discrimination because the state does not provide, for instance, uh, childcare facilities where uh, the children can, can be or uh, which can really help families, in particular women, mothers, uh, to cope. Um, you have this huge discrimination in the labor market that women often face a glass ceiling, say, I want to have a career, but the very male-dominated management often makes it impossible. So we see it in all dimensions and uh, groups, across groups in society, that some people, a lot of people, and I'm not talking about minorities, I'm talking about majorities, don't have the same opportunities, the same equal opportunities as others. And that's the single most important driving factor behind that inequality that we see. So some people are able to benefit from technological change. Some people are able to benefit from globalization. Others are not. That, to me, is the key factor. Now, what do we do about it? And you have two camps on the politically right and the politically left. People say, yes, we recognize inequality is a problem. It has a cost for society. And therefore, we need to increase the welfare state. We need to redistribute more through transfers and services. You have the political people more around the middle, the liberals and others, who say, no, inequality is not a problem because it's the outcome of functioning market economy. And therefore, we don't need more transfers or a bigger welfare state. Well, I think they're both wrong because if the key driver is a lack of equality of opportunity, you will not solve that with the bigger welfare states, with the higher tr transfer payments. You, create, you solve it by creating opportunities and giving everyone the same opportunities to access, to develop their own skills and talents, to get access to the labor market, get a good, uh, good job, a safe job where they can develop and where they can take free decisions. So the big promise, and coming back to the quote of Tucholsky, so what do people feel? People feel the social contract is no longer valid. And for much of the Western world, our social contract has to do with the social market economy. So the idea you have a functioning market economy and at the same time you have a social welfare state. And that promise of a social market economy has been broken. That contract is dysfunctional. On the one hand, because we don't have a functioning market economy, because people don't have the same opportunities. And if you look at issues like the Paradise Papers, where some companies, some individuals, purposefully get advantages and basically skirt the rules to take personal advantage. You, you cannot really talk about functioning market economy. You cannot talk about functioning economy when some people don't have the ability uh, to really compete because they cannot use their skills or because they don't have the same voice in the labor market. And we don't have really a functioning social welfare state because it fails to provide people with those opportunities. And there is a fundamental misunderstanding that many people feel a welfare state is there to compensate the losers from globalization in a functioning market economy. And that's a fundamental misunderstanding. The idea of the social market economy that a social welfare state is there to enable, to empower people, to make them able to take free decisions, to live a self-determined life, to be autonomous, to decide what do I want to do with my life and that of my family. And to address that, I see the key challenge to create those equality of opportunity through a better education system that focuses on early childhood education, in particular for families who cannot do the same at home because both parents have to work, 
uh, or they don't have the money really to provide for, for the children the same uh, educational standard as for, for richer kids. It has to do with family policies, in particular to empower women and other groups in society who don't have the same opportunities. It's about a fair taxation, a fair market economy where everyone has the same ability and the same chances to compete. Uh, and it has to do ultimately also with creating a labor market where people can work and have a future, can determine their future uh, and provide for old age. So in short, I think the social market economy is really the answer to the challenges we have today in terms of social inequality. But for that, we need to make it work again. And that can only be by creating opportunities so that people can again, again take choices, have choices, are free and autonomous to, to live a self-determining life. And that's the objective, and thereby I, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.